Kia ora. welcome to the first series of Stuff That Matters Now, a podcast brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I'm Harv, a.k.a. Ian Harvey, founder of Collective Intelligence, and it's going to be my great pleasure in this series to introduce to you a bunch of really cool people who are making a difference in the world every single day. Our job here at Collective Intelligence is to help curious people evolve and become more courageous so they can tackle the stuff that's needed to make this world a better place. You're about to listen to an epic chat I've just had with one of our many change-making Collective Intelligence members. Let's have a quick listen to a wee clip of some of the stuff we've talked about to give you an idea of what's ahead. There's a... There's a <laughs> Me as a person, there's a, there's a song by Diana Ross, reach out and touch somebody's hand. Mm-hmm. Make this world a better place if you can. And some people will laugh and go, oh, well, a lot of bloody la-la stuff. But what we need is love. And if we can foster a nation that are good people, that can work, that um, the structures are set up so that people are able to work, because when you work, you feel good. Uh, so that the structures are created to do that so that as a society we have moved to a place where we care for each other where we care for the land and you know we're currently promoting a tiaki promise for all visitors that come here that they will help look after our land Mm -hmm. we should also be doing a manaki promise to them where we guarantee that we will look after them before we crack on and talk about the stuff today's guest had to share with us. A big shout out to Rob McDonald and his talented team at, at Tiwonga at State over there in Hawke's Bay. Not only do these guys make international gold medal winning wines, they've helped us bring this podcast to your ears. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Rod. I was so grateful Che could fit me into his busy schedule. He is spread very thinly on the ground between his consultancy, chairman of the Maori Party, a whole range of things, and his whanau uh, back in Hamilton. Uh, so for the Che fit Wilson to fit me into his schedule and sit down with me for an hour and a half, uh, I felt really excited about this. There is few people I have learnt so much from. Uh, he knows New Zealand history so well, the culture of Maori, the language... He's incredibly generous uh, and accessible, uh, he, and that's why he's taught me so much personally. Uh, incredibly open-minded, can see the bigger picture, and he's just an all-round good guy. And this podcast was no exception. I learned two or three key things uh, in this interview that I didn't know. That was just a fabulous surprise. So listen up, uh, guys. If you want to learn any more about New Zealand and its history, this is the podcast to listen to. It's great to see you, Che. Thank you. Kia ora, Harv. Good to be here. Uh, and I met Che via his wife, Missy. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago. And I was facilitator of his team, which was very, very cool. And <laughs> seeing your progress the last few years, Che, I've been very excited. So thank you for your time. I know you're a really busy guy and appreciate your time here. This afternoon. Good to be here, Harv. Really good to be here. So, mate, we're going to crack straight into it. Um, Che, can you frame up for us what you're working on at the moment? Uh, You are multifaceted. You're a range of of things that you are involved in. So just for the audience, can you explain the things that you're involved in right now? Yes. So um, Che Wilson from Ohakune, and I live in Hamilton. Um, What am I doing? Well, I'm a dad of two. Uh, married to Missy, as you've already said. Uh, technically, I work for myself, technically. Uh, I've got a consulting company called Intigen Limited and work specifically in the uh, Māori community and environmental spaces, mainly around strategic facilitation. Technically, that's what I do. Uh, I'm also on a couple of boards, so on my iwi board, chair of my iwi, uh, Which is Ngāturangi. Ngāturangi, yep. based in Ohakune. Uh, I'm also on the board for the Wanganui River, for my iwi on the Wanganui River. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that looks after the legal personality, the legal personhood over the Wanganui River. Uh, and then 
I'm also on uh, I'm a director on Atia Wanganui Incorporation, which is a a massive farm from Ohakune down to the Wanganui River. How, how many hectares is that, Chai? Uh, it's about forty two thousand, just under forty two thousand hectares. Yep. So it's a it's a decent sized farm, and it's pretty progressive as well, right? So it's not just it's not just big. You're doing some cool stuff. Yeah, we're doing some cool stuff. You know, so working really well with with partners to be able to have our own brand uh, going into the states now and to some key restaurants around the country, and as well as working with the normal processors too. Yep. Uh, that's sheep, beef, uh, and honey. And um, I'm the president of the Māori Party, and uh, today I've just come back from storytelling. Uh, for a group called Te Reo Wainene Otua, where we share traditional stories uh, and help uh, our young people learn the stories, but then also for the secondary school students, help to teach them what's the relevancy of those stories in today's world. And so I spoke today about a big tanifa on the Wanganui River called Tutai Poroporo and asked the kids to think about what are the tanifa of their day, of today. And the two that they highlighted were suicide and pee. And so we then use the story and what are the lessons from the story to help them deal with those two big tanifa of suicide and pee. And what they got out of it was it's okay to ask for help because that's what our ancestors did when the tanifa was eating everybody. They got an expert in to kill the tanifa so that they could all live again. And so that was what I was doing today. Heaps of fun. Very cool to bring yeah. that that old method into the modern day, right? Because yeah. huge, huge issues. The uh, look, I digress slightly, but there's this wonderful program, uh, Wellington Paranormal, Taika Waititi set up. You know, and the last episode was on the Tony Far, and the and the, it was just and it was just wonderful to see him bring the humour to the Tony Far and yeah. so forth, and starting to understand that. Yeah. So Che, that you know, it's interesting you, you talk about the storytelling because. If I said, you know, who is Che Wilson, I know you as this great storyteller. And I remember um, sitting in Oakuni with you. Uh, we had just finished a collective intelligence meeting and you'd written a song for the team and, and sang the song to the team of the story of the day. Mm. And it was, it was one of the most memorable occasions I had. And the, the South Islanders were, were, were crying, everyone was crying, and I'm trying to wrap up this meeting. <laughs> you just <laughs> sang this song. And I'm going, oh, thanks, Cho. It was, just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was fabulous just to see that, uh, yeah, that come out on you, and you know, I, I know you're you know a superb storyteller. Mm. So, Che, tell us why um, why have you got involved with the Maori Party? What the, what's that all about? Um, simple, really. It's about us uh, in in Aotearoa, New Zealand, being able to to be free to be Maori, as well as being a person from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And what I mean by that is. What, what a lot of people don't understand about our laws is that there are so many restrictions on Māori land, um, there are so many restrictions on Māori resources where we're not allowed to do things that other businesses are allowed to do. On our tribal entities, the government create all of these, these restrictions. You know, on a normal board, you'd expect a board to be selected by skill and expertise. We were, we're not allowed to do that. And the government puts these restrictions on us. Um, so that's why we have so many challenges. And I've chosen to be uh, active. I've been in the Māori Party since it was established. Um, but I, I chose to step up uh, and take a leadership role to allow us to be free to be Māori in this beautiful nation we all call home. In addition to that... Uh, the monster that is the system that we um, are part of, the Westminster system, encourages haves and have-nots. Mm -hmm. Whereas what the Māori Party tries to encourage is to get rid of that and let's just help each other. Because if we come from a Māori perspective, there should be enough for everybody in this beautiful country. 
we have the ability to produce food that can feed, depending on who you're talking to, 20 to 30 million people. Mm-hmm. So we should be... Well, if there was no wastage, it would be 40 million people. Yeah. Yep. And um, so therefore we should at least be putting away food to feed 6 million here. That's the 4 million that live here and for us to look after our visitors. And then you export the rest to help the rest of the world. And so if we were to come from a Māori perspective, that's that's the value that we bring by being part of this political system is, is encouraging us to look differently because whether it's Einstein, whether it's Silicon Valley, what they're all saying is the problems that we're currently facing as a result of the industrial revolution and capitalism, neoliberalism, the answers will come from indigenous solutions. And that's why I've joined the Māori Party is because I know that there's magic that we have that we can share and that we want to share with the world to help home and others. So, Jay, just give us a let's just go back a couple of steps. Give us an example where you talk about Māori entities don't have the freedom of other entities. Give us an example of that. So, an example of that is Māori land is multiply owned land. Mm-hmm. It's in a trust. It's in an or an incorporation. Yep. And we usually aren't allowed to loan from banks. And um, unless you're a big successful entity that's fought the fight to get recognition from the banks. Yep. And usually the small entities, even if all their collateral is more than what they're asking to loan, they get blocked. Because there's a system that doesn't like the notion of multiply owned land. And so that's one example of of the banks not willing even today, Joe. I thought, Even today. So I, it's still happening I, today. I, I, I the thought, big people like Atiho yep. and Wakatu, which is Kono, yep. uh, and PKW and, and uh, all the big ones, we're fine. But all of the ones who are still growing, they still get the rubbish. And it's just ridiculous, even today. Yeah, so you've got that gap of the, the, of the inequality then growing. Yeah. Right? Even with the mar- Okay, so I didn't, I didn't know that. I would have, I would have thought... All those, all those would have broken down some time ago. Yeah, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I'm shocked to hear that. Yeah, even with the settlements, Che coming in, how does that affect the the how the bank sees it? So the settlements are treated differently. Yep, because they're settlement entities, and they have cash, so the banks will work with them straight away. Okay, but it's the land entities which have been here for years. Yep, where even today it's still hard. Yeah, so so that's one example. There are other examples as well, and it's it's about how do we change this rubbish because it's just not good enough. You know, a classic example is this freshwater policy. This freshwater policy is going to stop the the Taiwa. There's there's two bits of work. There's freshwater policy, and there's a Māori land review. The Māori land review is encouraging these small smaller trusts to develop themselves. But the freshwater policy is establishing policy that's going to stop that. That's going to stop that development because it's it's natural land or land that hasn't been developed and we want all of those lands not to be developed to help save the environment. Right. And because we have been blocked from access to grow our land, grow our resources, we now have to suffer even though we want to uh, develop ourselves and do well for ourselves. So it's a sacrifice that Māori have to go through for the betterment of the world. And and I'm not saying that we don't need to do our part to save the environment, but because this unanimous, all-cohesive notion of government, we all know that, and this has got nothing to do with any party, but government doesn't talk to itself. Right. And as a result of government not talking to itself, um, there are people who suffer as a result of that. Right. Chay, what, um, you know, I'm really interested in uh, in the space with the political space of, of Māori and where they sit because, you know, I've learned a lot from you over the years. Uh, and, and you talked about 
uh, and I'm di- digressing, but I still think it's relevant. You talked, you know, years ago of what Savage did uh, to the Maori population and and the impact, the negative impact he had uh, there. And just talk us through that because I think it's a really interesting aspect that a lot of New Zealanders wouldn't think about. So Michael Joseph Savage, he was respected by Maoridom. He was the man who established and led the the um, Labour Party and um, entered into a covenant with the prophet uh, Wiremu Ratana. Uh, and so all of that's common knowledge and um, he is respected because of that. However, when he started to build all of the... Um, the uh, the public, all of the public housing, all of those homes in Wellington, that land belonged to somebody. And that land belonged to the local iwi who still had their land in Wellington. In Miramar and Kilburnie and other parts of Wellington was Māori land which was literally confiscated, done through another set of laws so it's not seen as confiscation, but literally taken off and those people had to suck it in for the betterment of the nation. And so there's things like that, and not just with Mickey Savage, because all of the other stuff, is still you still got to recognise that, all of the good stuff. But but that's what happens every generation, through every every round of, of leadership. There are all of these sacrifices for the nation that often have to be sacrificed by Māori. For the rest of the nation, you also talked to me um, once about you know bringing in the social welfare and so forth you know, and the negative impact it had. Oh, absolutely, the, yeah. So social welfare, what that did is that forced us to change our belief system and our social structure, because in the past you had to work your land, you had to grow food, because that was a key component of our culture. Social welfare meant that you no longer needed to do that and you would get money instead to live. During the Depression, so a decade before Mickey Savage, during the Depression, you'll, you'll hear all this talk about swaggers. And swaggers were Pake or non-Māori people who would walk around the country looking for help, looking for home, looking for shelter, looking for food. And nine times out of ten, many of them would end up in Māori communities. Because the Māori people go, you come here, we'll help you, because they're founded on a principle, there's enough for everybody. And so they would feed them, and when they died, they'd bury them in their urupa. And so in my own family urupa, there are a number of non-Māori, unmarked graves, we know where they are, but that's because our koro didn't want them to have a pauper funeral, where they were then treated as almost nothing. Mm. Instead, our people would would then look after them, have a tangi for them, and then give them some mana when they're laid to rest. And so the social welfare system, you know, we were we had to work for ourselves, you had to make your own money, and then if you had more, you shared it with those that couldn't do that. And so social welfare changed that for us forever. Yep. Yep. And sadly, we're in the situation we are, in, are now as a country. So, Chang, what's what's your biggest t- disappointment? Right, what, right here, right now, in New Zealand today, what's the thing that's just annoying the hell out of you? Oh, there's a couple of things, but the biggest one right now is homelessness or houselessness. Um, you know, I've worked in central government, and I've been the deputy of a minister uh, of a ministry, so deputy secretary for um, for a government agency. And the bureaucracy slows everything down, creates Wellington solutions for fielding, creates Wellington solutions for Ruatoria or um, Kumara on the west coast, rather than solutions that can help that local area. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't have homelessness in our country we should be able to identify how many of those people that are homeless are unwell and how do we house them and look after them. We should then be able to identify how many 
that are homeless are working but are living in a car or living in a carport or just moving from place to place, dossing. And then we should also be able to work out who has actually been homeless for some time, for more than six months, so that we can provide different solutions for the different categories. You talk to people on the street who who are working with those families, they come up with really simple solutions. And, you know, sometimes that second category, which is people who still have a job but don't have a house, can't afford to rent, you know, there's some really quick wins that you could get there to help them through before they drop down to the next category. Yep. Because once they drop down to the next category, that's when it gets bloody hard. So what what's what needs to what needs to happen to change that, Joe? Uh, there's a couple of things. Our building rules, our building regulations, uh, you know, earthquake proof and all of that. All of the timber or all of the resources that are required to build our houses have to go through a testing process. And you know, those big companies, I better not name names. <laughs> Those big companies and the bureaucracy have through through advocacy have effectively slowed everything down mm-hmm. so that it's only their resources that can come here that can be used to build houses. So that's why the resources that we require, because we need more resources than we can produce in this country to build our houses. And they're slowed down so that everything comes through a, a funnel which is feeding those big companies. Whereas what we should do is any resources that have already been approved in Japan, because their standards are higher than ours, we should go, yes, let them in, let the ones we've approved, and look if there are any other countries that have similar or higher standards than us, because it's all about the earthquakes. It's legitimate. Yep. Yep. That will then bring resources in and will also bring some resources which are cheaper. And if we can do that, that's going to help us to start to build things. It's interesting. I talked to a, a builder about this last year, and he said, look, Harv, we are building houses now that if they were cars, uh, it would be impossible to die in the car. Right? And he goes, I think they've gone too far with the standards, that uh, that it's got to the ridiculous stage now that, that the requirements are so, so stringent. That oh, they are ridiculous. And, like, like they're so stringent, but that's deliberate because then that funnels only through to certain companies. Right, yeah. And so, you know, the, it's, and it's all been through advocacy and putting in submissions to make sure that the rules are hard. So... Because whereas you go to Australia, go and visit your family in Aussie, man, they're just popping up houses. Mm. Mm. They're popping up houses, and that's because the rules aren't ridiculous. Right, right. So that's one thing. What else would you? What what what's the other area that you'd you'd want to see change in? Suicide. Yep. Suicide. Um, look at the place we live in. It's beautiful. Um, but what we've done is, is. Generally, as society, we've become we've become, we've become addicted to the noise, and the noise of today is all of these different pressures, you know, with the old devil and the angel talking to your mind, and so we're addicted to the noise of society, and we don't know how to how to deal with things today, and we're not creating people who are as resilient. And a lot of that is because there's so many other pressures, devices or say, and all of this access to technology. Uh, and it's not the technology that's the issue, but it's it's the content that we're getting access to, which is putting extra pressure on us. And therefore, um, it's driving us to a dark place. And medicine can't actually cure that dark place. There are times when there's a chemical imbalance and yes, that's when you need medicine Mm -hmm. to help balance things up. But a lot of it is actually an energy imbalance. And 
when you feed negative with negative, you're just going to get worse. Yep. Whereas we've got to work out and find out ways to share other ways of doing things. And there's some amazing work that's been do- being done at the moment. You know, there's this men's medicine that's just come out recently on TV. Uh, there's another guy who does Māori movement. Mm-hmm. And so we've got to actually work with holistic options, not just a pill. A pill that is encouraged, that the psychologists are encouraged to do through the different pharmaceutical companies that they're registered to. And if you do this, you'll get more money. And yep. so it's a vicious cycle. Yep. Cho, we've got a number of our um, facilitators who are into uh, understanding this intergenerational trauma. Mm-hmm. And I I only learned about it about three years ago, and, and I didn't really believe it at first, and that uh, this trauma can be seen for two or three generations and transmitted in the D- DNA. Mm. And I was... I was uh, yeah, really sceptical around that. And I actually talked to one of our uh, animal geneticists and she goes, yeah, yeah we, we, we monitor this all the time through livestock and you can see, you know, uh, effects on the female and so forth coming through two or three generations. So yeah. I was like, ah, this is a real thing. Yeah, and it is a real thing because it's, um, we're animals. Yeah. We, often, we often forget that we are animals. And um, and one of the things is, is that intergenerational trauma as I know it from a Māori perspective, will actually stay there for seven seven generations. Right. Um, if you deliberately don't do things to intentionally move from that trauma to positive energy. Yep. And you have to continue to do things so that it almost becomes ritualistic yep. to retrain the brain and the body. Because you know how Māori talk about being from the land and of the land? That's because we ate from the land. Mm. And when after generations, as you eat that land, eat the food from the land, therefore eating the land, uh, you become the land. And so whenever something traumatic happens to that land, you then start to eat that as well. Right. And so there's science to this. Right. And, and, and so intergenerational trauma, when you lose everything, when you enter into honourable agreements – which are then uh, where there's only deceit uh, and lies, that takes you to a really bad place, especially once you lose your house, your home, your castle. And once you lose your house, your home, your castle, um, you go to a deep hole. Mm. And if you can pull yourself out of that hole, then that's great. But if you can't and you're given welfare to feed you in the hole rather than pull you out of it, you stay in the hole. Yep. And then generations and generations. And so it's easy to go, oh, they just need to bloody get out of get out of that rut. But if it's an intergenerational I, I to, rut. I used to think like that, Jay. I used, oh. I used to think like that. Many do. Yeah. Many do. And from all walks of life. So not just non Māori, but even Māori. But when when you have empathy once you've heard and you then have empathy for that, that that takes you to a place, okay, how can I contribute to helping people mm. come out of the hole? Because mm. mm. they've still got to come out themselves, mm. but it's what can we all do to help? Mm. Because we have to help whether we like it or not because we've got to help our nation. Mm. We've got to help this place we call home. This, this, you know, the, 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 my, my big frustration with the New Zealanders, you know, those two things, the, the suicide rate in this beautiful country, and go, what is going on? Yeah. And, you know, it's scary. One, it's scary. We've got Carla Nanagara's just gone on uh, to head up the new uh, suicide um, uh, thing with the under the wellbeing budget, which is very exciting. Carla's hugely experienced, and you know, if anybody can help in this space, it'll, it'll be. Uh, Carla, and she's got the knowledge as coming off from a coroner. But uh, so that's that's something we've got to get sorted. Uh, but the other one for me is inequality. Mm. It just you know the the harm inequality does uh, is phenomenal. And well, both of those points are, are subsets of inequality. Yeah, mm. yeah, and 
you know, I have come from a good old capitalist background uh, and it was it's all about just getting ahead and compiling capital and all that sort of stuff, right? And it was it was all good stuff and work hard and, and but the impact it had on others I do, look, I, I don't think we ever went about wanting to harm other people. I think you're right. I don't think anybody does it deliberately. But the system has been created so that there are unconscious levers. And those levers um, help one group grow and another group fall. And and I, I, I truly believe that nobody does it intentionally. Well, there's two groups. There's those that intentionally do it and the rest. There's there's definitely no malice or anything. It's that a system has been created as you're growing the man and working for the man yep. and all of that. And I think the unconscious one, you know, the ones that are conscious about it, Che, then fuck, we can just, yeah. you, know, you know, forget about <laughs> it's them. It's pretty blatant. Yeah, yeah, you can forget about them. They'll, they'll do whatever they want to do. The big set is the ones who aren't conscious. Mm. And, you know, I uh, was really unconscious about my privilege and and that I had a privileged upbringing because when you uh, come from a privileged background, you don't necessarily it's understand that, right? It's a norm. Mm. You don't know it. Uh, and you don't know that you have got this advantage over other people. Uh, and I, learned, I, I learned a phrase last week yeah. called structural bias, not unconscious bias. And this woman was talking about it's not unconscious bias, it's structural bias, where structures have been set up like capitalism, yep. where they give bias to one over another. And I, yeah, yeah, I get that. Mm. I mm. get that. And so you're working in a, in a structure which has bias. And so you're, you're not actually trying to do anything bad. You're just working in a structure that has massive bias and privilege. You know, you and I are lucky. We both have privilege. Yep. And I have privilege and I often um, get challenged by others of Māori descent who don't, uh, who don't have the privileges I have. And it used to hurt me, but now I get it as I continue to learn myself and I'm also facilitating a master's program. So why did and, it? Why did and it, I've learnt. Why did it hurt you, Che? What did it? Why did it hurt you? Well, because I was raised in a normal Western way, where you work, you work hard, you do well for yourself. And I thought it's not my fault that I've done well for myself. And then I realised after, ah, oh, shit, and it's not their fault. Yeah. That they were disadvantaged. Yeah, yeah. But at first, it used to hurt me because of my own ignorance. Right, right. You know, and like these aren't the words, but this was the sentiment: follow the Pakeha way and do well. Your Maori stuff, you keep it to your heart, but don't you go out there and talk Maori? Don't you go out there and do Maori things? You do that at home. Right, and um. You know, and I, I talk. I've got quite a few friends from different ethnicities. They go, "Oh, that's what we do." Yeah. Oh no, when we walk out our door, we're New Zealanders. We're not Chinese or Indian or anything else. No, we're New Zealanders. When we go home, oh no, no, we're not New Zealanders. We're Indian or Chinese or Samoan. Yeah. 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 So, Char, I'm just going to wrap up on the national uh, on the national party. <laughs> but just just coming back to that. That is changing? Is that changing where Maori are becoming okay to be Maori? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and it's taken probably 50 years of the Renaissance from um, the 70s, the early 70s through to the land march in 75. There's that Renaissance has taken 50 years for us to now be okay to talk in Maori, to do things Maori, um, you know, when I was when I was at college, I was working at the local New World, and I would always hungi my elders that came in to do shopping. And one of my kuros, he said to me afterwards at the marae when he saw me at another gathering, he said, "You're a good boy to come up and hungi us." I'm, oh, why kuro? And he says, 
because too many are embarrassed. Yeah. And I remember that. It was my yeah. grandmother's brother. I remember it and it just stuck in my heart to make sure, okay. What year is that? What year was that? That was the early 90s. Wow, that's not very far. That's not that yeah. long ago. Yeah, early 90s. My koro jacky. <laughs> Yeah, that's not long ago. And, you know, I've written about this and talked about it. It's just, uh, you know, we had Māori around us and as long as they behaved like Pākehā, mm. everybody was happy, right? Yeah. Well, and that's what we had to do. We had to behave like Pākehā. Um, Dad was part of the um, part of the fire brigade. My kōro was part of the Lions and Mum was part of the Catholic Women's Welfare League and did all of these things for us to fit in. Right, and then we did things at home and at the marae. Right, when did you got a, get a feeling? When did you get a feeling that things, the tide was changing? Oh, for me personally, when I was twelve, because I got got disqualified for speaking at a um, it's either a Lions or Rotary speech competition, and they had done, done the draw, and I happened to be the first one to speak. It was at my school. And so the principal says, oh, I think you should do a mihi to welcome everybody before you enter into your speech. Ah. And I was 12. Oh, okay. Okay. Spoke to my uncle. Um, gave me some words. And um, I did a brief mihi. Then I went into my speech. And um, I got disqualified. And um, and then when you work at the new world, you Because, because Why? Because how dare I speak that language in, a, in this competition? Right. Those were one of the comments, and the other one was, um, "It's an English speech competition." He didn't speak English at the beginning. Right. And so I got disqualified, and I just thought, "Oh yeah, I didn't really think much of it." But the fuss from uh, my principal and my elders, mum, dad, and and my elders because the race relations conciliator had just been established. And um, it was all this hoo-ha when I then realised, ah, this is injustice. That wasn't the word I used at the yeah, time. Yep, yep, yep. Something wasn't right. Yeah, this isn't right. So, yeah. Mm, and so that's when I realised. And from there, because um, I had the uncle down in, in Wellington who my elders were all working with, and there are all of these positions starting to be established in Wellington yeah. to challenge the so-called norm. Yeah, yeah. I'd look about. There'll be about the same time my mother came back from from church to say that she'd heard the induction of the of a new bishop, a Maori bishop. She said, "Oh, those bloody Maoris! They just go on and on and on. And just, you can't hear what they're saying and so forth." And, <laughs> I, and I was listening to this, and I was looking at her, going, oh, "I thought it'd been cool to have a Maori bishop, but..." Ah, but she was just, you know, what were they talking about? And, and she found it very, very rude and inconvenient. Which church that was that? Anglican church yeah, in, yeah. in Piata. Yeah. And it was very, very, she, she was quite affronted by this. <laughs> you know, but that was the first time I thought something's changing. Mm. And that might have been about the same, just, yeah, uh, yeah that was, yeah, interesting. Yeah. And going, oh, there's something changing here. Yeah. Uh, and And the fact that she was... Upset, but she had no power to change this. Well, and this is the thing with inequality and and privilege is people only make a fuss when they start to feel that things are changing for them. Mm. Like everybody's moaning about Māori at the moment. No, they're getting too much. Well, actually, we're not getting too much, but things are changing. Mm. You're not actually losing anything, but it feels like people are losing control. Yeah. Okay, I want to get on to that next. Let's go back to the Māori Party. Uh, che, what is the... You know, I saw uh, Woody Jackson pushing back the other day from Labour Party and so forth, and and I'm not sure it was directly with you, but there was some pushback uh, going on there. And so what is the, what is the thing that you want to uh, achieve with the Māori Party? So with the Māori Party, we are there to be Māori to be advocates of Māori principles, not race, but Mm. to be advocates of Māori principles, which many Māori follow, but to be advocates of those principles so that we can 
provide those principles as another solution to help us as a nation. Got it. So I could vote for the Māori Party. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we'll be pushing for party vote. Yeah. Okay. So I could be voting for uh, indigenous ways of doing things, of looking after the land, of society and so forth. Exactly. Right. So that's a big difference to the mm. other parties, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, when, you, when you're a national, irrespective of your ethnicity, you're there for the values of national. Yep. The values of green, the values of labour. We're here for the values of Māori. Okay. Māori values, not Māori race. Got it. But I hadn't, I hadn't mm. thought about that before. Hmm. Mm. I've ne- and you know what? I've never considered voting for the Māori Party because it's not, I'm not that race. Mm. Right? Mm. But, you know, and, and you see some great quotes at the moment that for us to save the world, we need to be adopting more indigenous practice. Yeah. To, uh, you know, because you guys knew what to do. We came along and sort of fucked it up a little bit, <laughs> you know, on the, on the way in, right? And it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, okay, okay, mm. okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's clear. That's cool. clear. So, Chad, I'd love to talk about the, the uh, iwi because I know that you've got a huge amount of experience and knowledge around this. Um, where are we at with the with the settlements? Uh, how much longer before are we making progress? Where are we at with the bigger picture of the iwi settlements? So a treaty settlement is um, just a couple of back, back, background things. A treaty set, settlement is a full and final settlement until the government breaches the law again. And so every time there's a new form of settlement, it's because the government has broken the law. And um, so that's number one. So to answer it in a really simplistic way, this round of settlements will finish in the next 10 years, but the government's already breaching the law. Right. And in, in, in my settlement, the Ngāti Dangi settlement, uh, it went through its third reading in July and became law uh, a week or two later. And the policy development that the government's developing is already putting pressure on the new law. Why do they do that, Che? Because the government doesn't talk to itself. Because there's structural bias and the structures have been developed not to talk to each other because a bureaucracy is about can, keeping control. And so not even, the gov- not even the politicians can move some things. And people will say, oh, they're too slow. Um, but it's actually the structure has been established so that they don't talk. And then that then causes conflict on whatever else has been established. And in this case, law. And so there are breaches that happen because policy policy um, developers aren't over everything. They're only over their silo. Right. Mm. Is that going to change? Only if we change the structure. Right. Because one thing that hasn't changed, you know, we all know MMP now, and we all know that MMP means uh, parties, political parties, and the MPs have to negotiate and work with each other. And we've had that for what, almost 25 years-ish. Government are only just starting to negotiate and work with each other. Right. Within the, within the system. Within the system. Yeah. And so, you know, um, it's going to create... We, we, we need some massive structural change to do that, but that structural t- change doesn't get you votes. So for any government to actually do that they're not going to get many votes about it because we don't understand our political system generally as a nation because we're not taught about it. And politicians, you know, I only learnt this the last few years, that politicians only affect about 10 to 15% of what goes on. Mm-hmm. The, the big machine is the bureaucrats and that just ticks And over. the mana is in... Those immediately below the CEOs of each department, of each ministry. Yeah. That's where the money is. I've tried to engage twice with central government 
and I hope never to do it again. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was, it didn't make sense. Uh, the ignorance and the bullying and the and the patch protection was just unbelievable. Mm. And yet, I know people that work in there; they're nice people. Yeah. So I don't know what happens to them. Yeah. You know, when they go into that system, but it's uh, got a very good training system where you have to follow process, and processes often make no sense, and they have no human heart to them. Which has been deliberate to avoid bias, right? But it actually creates bias because those that develop the structures already have their bias. Yes, so it's already fed yeah. into the design of it. Yeah, right. And now they use post-its and flash words from Silicon Valley, like design thinking and all of that. Yeah, collaboration and co-design. When actually they're just words because they're not actually using those theory, those principles to change. They're just using a couple of post-its to make it look like they've moved right. to Silicon Valley. Right. But the beast doesn't want to change. Yeah. Yeah, look, we, we put a proposal to uh, to government and um, <laughs> uh, with one of a member, uh, through a member, and it was just, it was going to make a difference, so about 3 to $4 billion a year. And uh, it just needed a law change in the IP laws. Mm. Uh, you have to do, what I've, what I've learnt through the iwi space is you've got to work with the bureaucrats to make them look good for you to get anything. Yeah, it's not a skill I've got. <laughs> <laughs> so you went through uh, the settlement with Ngāta Rangi. Mm-hmm. Uh, just tell us, because I, I, I learned a huge amount from you understanding that process uh, and from Anaki understanding that the EWs were settling for one two percent of what was mm-hmm. what was, they were entitled to, uh, but then getting on with it. But what we don't get a feel for is how much work goes into a yeah. settlement. So in our case, it took twenty eight years from from the day that we lodged our claim to the third reading of our bill for it to become enacted. Twenty eight years. Twenty eight years. People have died in that time. Absolutely. We only had a few original uh, claimants that got to see that day, and they most of them won't get to see any of the benefits um, or the fruit of their labour. And for most iwi, uh, most iwi, their negotiators don't get to see the fruit either. So I miss that with the, negoti- uh, with the negotiators. Most of the negotiators don't get to see the fruit of their labour either because they die. Because most of them are old. And so it took 28 years, cost us millions. And I truly believe if we entered into a, a commercial form of negotiation, after doing the history you could cut it in half because you still need to do the history because you have to prove, this is one of the stink things, we have to prove what the government did. Right. And we have to identify each act, each policy that was used to take our land off us, to do all these things to us. From 1860s. From 1840. Right. Yeah, from 1840 through to uh, the mid-90s. I forget the date now. And so it's that period just because that's when the, the rules were established for this new form of negotiation. And the other the other crazy thing is that, you know, um, legislation often gets refreshed. But treaty settlement legislation, they refuse to refresh it. Because if they refresh it, iwi that have already settled will go, hey, you're giving them more. What about us? So it's a stink system. Uh, it's correct. Most iwi only get between 1% and 2%. Um, from your original offer, very rarely are you able to double it. Uh, Ngāti Dangi, we were fortunate to almost triple it. 
one of the only iwi to ever be able to trip on, but it's still not much. It's only 17 million. So we got offered a, a band between six to eight. And what we've also done is any iwi that's still negotiating, if they want our information, we give it to them. Mm. And we do that because you've got to short circuit the system because the system is done. Mm. It's been established so that um, you work with different departments within the Office of Treaty Settlements so that um, you always, they will always lose the institutional knowledge. So it's a deliberate ploy so that um, there's no institutional knowledge and any agreements made with that department can't be passed over unless you push them. And so deliberately all the way through, um, it's been designed that way. There's an equation. So it's people, it's land loss, and there's a few hidden things. And so people, it depends on what what um, the census says. And if your iwi is a legitimate iwi but never been registered under census, then Treasury and the Office of Treaty Settlement get to choose what your population is. <laughs> right. And so so our population was just under 1,200 people. Even though my what I call my immediate family, which is from mum's grandparents down, there's about 2,500 of us. And as an iwi, we estimate that there's probably 9,000 of us. And even though we show our um, genealogical charts and all of this, and we show um, a register of land trusts within our tribal domain. No, your number is just under 1,200. So that affects our quantum straight away. Land loss. um, There are different types of land loss, but they calculate it. If you have raupatu, which is a certain act associated with the land wars, um, then you'll get more money. But for those of us who collaborated with the Crown and tried to help the Crown, we get treated like everybody else. And in our case, we got a massive confiscation, which legally isn't a confiscation because it was proclaimed by the Crown. And so the Crown proclaimed our mountain. It was never a gift. So the Tongariro National Park has been established under a lie. Te Heuhe never gifted the land, the peaks. He, he, he did what is called a tuku. And a tuku is an exchange with strings. And um, it's the same as the Treaty of Waitangi. He, he gave the tuku in the Māori language. It was all documented in the Māori language. Same as the treaty, the majority of people signed the Māori language one, which is different to the English one. And um, so Te Heuhe, he gave a tuku of the peaks of Tongariro, Ngāruhoe, and the northern side of Ruapehu. The southern side of Ruapehu was proclaimed in 1907 where the government, where, where the sovereign then said, this land is all now ours. And even though we had worked with the Crown and we have to carry that stigma as being collaborators. By your people? Uh, by Māori them. Yep. Um, you know, all of these, each tribe has their own story to show the level of commitment we had in the 1840s. One of our ancestors, Winyata Tapuhaki, his son happened to be at a place where people were killed. He happened to be there. He wasn't part of the group that actually killed them. He took his son to the magistrate and said, my son was there. His son, Tawahuri, was then hung. And so that was the level of that was the level of our commitment to this relationship. Um, and there's never been a good partner back. It's been an abusive partner. We've continued, and sadly, we, Maori have been the battered wife mm. that continues to go back mm. to their abusive non-Maori husband who keeps beating them up, keeps giving them hol- that's hidings. A, that, that's a that's a great analogy, mm. Che, isn't it? Yeah. Great analogy. And and you know, 
and the challenge that's happening today, especially what you what you watch on social media, both sides having big explosions, is this next generation are saying we're sick of being battered wives. We had it. And so what's happening is all of the all of this history that we've been taught and that's only showing being shown the light of day is is being revealed and it's quite quite confronting for non Māori. We never knew this, we never taught this. And because there's so much frustration and I've just fed up with the amount of inequity uh, and all of these other challenges, instead of Māori giving them giving the non Māori time to breathe, they just keep throwing more and more examples. And so non Māori going, Stop it, that's enough, that's enough. It doesn't and, and their only response is it's not true. Because it's just too sore. Mm. It hurts. And you know, my heart wants to say we need to slow down to take people on the journey. Mm-hmm. But my mind is going, if I say that publicly, well, I'm doing it now, <laughs> if, I, if I say that and push that in front of the next generation, they'll tell me to go and catch some fresh air mm. because they've had enough. Mm. And it's what we have to do, which is one thing that Hone Harawida said, is when um, he came to present to this master's program that I run, um, he talked about the march for the for the foreshorn seabed. He said we had to take people on the march because people were getting ready to kill. He says that we can't have that. Mm. And so Horne is painted as this really big, ugly protester. But when you hear him speak about his worries, that our young kids then were wanting to kill, shit, you've got to take your hat, hat off to people who led the march because they knew something deeper was happening. Yeah, and let, let uh, so that was like a, a release of pressure. Release of energy. Yeah, it yeah. was the haka yeah. that they needed, which is why when they marched down Wellington, you saw so many people half naked doing the haka because it's about ensuring that the energy is released in a positive way. It's not easy stuff, eh? <laughs> What's... Um uh, I'm thinking, where do I take this from here? I let's just I just want to wrap up the the, the settlement uh, process. Uh, Napui has just had a change of leadership, and you know at times that looks as though that's never going to get resolved. Do you see? Do you see Napui coming to a place where they can settle? Um, I feel sorry for Napui because. The media shits on them, the politicians shit on them, many iwi shit on them, when actually it's a crap process. And the Treaty of Waitangi was never signed by iwi. It was signed by the subgroups, by hapu. And so this is going back to 19, 1840? 1840. So just explain that to me. It wasn't signed by Iwi. It was never signed by Iwi. It was signed by and the And treaty Hapu. settlement isn't actually signed by Iwi. It's signed by this fiction that the Crown have created, which they call a large natural group. Huh. And so it just happens that many of the large natural groups are Iwi. Some of them are actually collectives. So Waikato Tainui is a collective. Ngaita is actually a, connect, a collective. Right. Ngāpuhi is a collective. And the collective, is, or the, the, the parts that make the collective of Ngāpuhi, some of them have wanted to stay as a collective, some of them rightfully want to be negotiating in their rightful parts. And that's never portrayed because it's easy to go, oh, look at those crazy, crazy northerners. And it's really unfair on Ngāpui that they're treated that way. Because what we've done in Wanganui is Ngāti Rangi, Ngāti Wernuku, Ngāti Hawa and the lower Wanganui River grouping, Te Atiho, is we were able to legitimately negotiate for us to go back into our subgroups. Because then you get more cut of the pie. 
Right. And Kahunganu from Wairua right down to the Wairarapa, if they were to be negotiated through the normal way, that would be one iwi. But they've been able to negotiate as six large natural groups. Right, yeah, this is making sense to me. So if you look at um, Naitahu, of course will be, you know, that's a huge area. It's a massive area and legitimately they could have been broken up in a number of different ways. You know, the top of the south was broken up into eight ways. From from Blenheim through to uh, Motueka, or through to the west coast, the top of the west coast, yep. for, to the, the spit. Um, and so eight groups just in the top of the south. So, I mean... So, yeah, large natural groups. Yeah, so, na- so now you're saying this. I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. So the likes of Tainui, mm. what is that? Is that, is that a, a... So Waikato Tainui is an entity which people call it an iwi, but no, it's an entity. It's a collective of the tribes of the Waikato River and some of their relations. Okay, so I'm confused. So tell me what is what is an iwi? So an iwi is a group of people that descend from a ancestor, yep. an eponymous ancestor, who that tribe is named after. Yep. And then you get collectives. And so the, the three classic collectives are Wanganui, Waikato, and Te Arawa. Because those aren't people. And um, so the Wanganui, we've decided to go back into our subgroups. Waikato have most have decided to be part of a bigger collective. Te Arawa have done both. So they've done some collective stuff and some subgroup stuff. Okay, so now I'm getting it. So tell me with Napui, what would solve, what would get that wheel turning? Because, I mean, I look at this and I go, you know, Northland desperately need the investment. And, you know, it's a stunning place, lovely mm. people, but, you know. It's they're, hard up there. It, it, it's tough. Destitute some it's, places. Yeah, it's destitute. I've lived up there, right? Mm. And, and so a settlement up there would make a huge difference. No, it wouldn't. No? It, w- it will help. But the classic example I give is if you do the analysis per capita of descendants of Waikato, they are poorer than Ngāpuhi, even though they've had 20 years of settlement. Explain that to me. So their household income, Waikato people are poorer, according to the stats, than Ngāpuhi people who haven't settled. So treaty settlement, people, the the media and the government have portrayed that treaty settlement will be the panacea for individual tribal members. It's not. It will help those that are engaged in the tribe to be part of programs, but they don't get paid a dividend, and so it's not going to help their home household income. It will help grow an asset base. And so it's all going to take a few decades right. for it to start to tune where they can then be large employers or whatever else for those based in the tribal area. Right. And roughly there's 10% for each tribe that are based in their tribal area, roughly. Okay. And the rest are dispersed outside. All around the world. All around the world. Mm-hmm. Except for the odd one, like some of the Auckland tribes, most of the people that are there. Ngaitahu, about half are there, right, etc. So, Che, uh, and I hope this answer is positive. <laughs> <laughs> the the settlements are they making a difference to the Maori people? Um, they are helping to give tribes leverage. They are helping to give tribes leverage, and you can see them as new startups in the provinces. Whether they're helping Māori individuals, um, we're yet to see. But they are startups, you know, so a $17 million startup yeah. in Ohakune. Yep. Takes time. Yeah. Takes so. time. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because you see the odd failure, and there haven't been many, and all oh, the media attention that gets. Mm. And they, they forget all the 
All the positive all the, stuff. Well, and all of the other failures, they never get that attention. It's yeah. so bloody racist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's close up because you just go, you know, it's, it's, and, uh, you know, until I understood this more through you, Liana, Missy, you know, it's, it's understanding this process because, and how difficult it is and how long it takes. Mm. Uh, and I remember the years that, you know, you were going back was in Fords to, to Wellington and, you know, it, it was it was the coolest uh, thing when you hosted your collective intelligence team up in Awakuni because uh, people were, uh, uh, you know, your family was so pleased to meet us that there were some honkies that actually cared about you. You know, it was very very cool and and to see the uh, the trust they had of us. Mm. Because we were there to support you. Yeah. yeah. It was very, very cool. And it was just... Well, yeah. and, and and for me, the way I've tried to do things is where are some amazing examples of things going well and how do we bring them home to show our people or how do we take our people to those places to show our people? Yeah. Because once our people can see something with their eyes and with their gut, because you need that gut, gut instinct is pretty bang on. Yeah. And so how do we get people to see and feel through their gut? Because that takes them to another place. And so by having collective intelligence come up home, it was about also exposing you to help our, our, our families, yep. to help our tribe, to see other things as well. Because um, just as te ao Māori is scary for non-Māori, the, the Pākehā world is very scary for Māori. Yeah. Um, but it's not seen because it's just seen, it, people just see it as the normal. Yeah. But it's funny, when we go overseas, especially in Asia, on Māori delegations I've been on, um, we go and we start eating all their food. And they go, we told New Zealand to don't eat that food. <laughs> oh, no, no, we do. <laughs> but you're from New Zealand. Oh, no, no, no. And then we're all eating the fish yeah. eyes and everything else. And, oh, <laughs> Yeah. Chai, it was interesting. Uh, in February this year, I went to a, a, a social enterprise unconference down in Levin, and there was a, a young Maori man from Taranaki, and he was in my group. And on the second morning, he was just a bit off, mm. and I can't remember his name. Lovely guy. And I went over and said, mate, what's, what's up, you know? And he goes... Uh, uh, I'm really struggling. And, and he didn't talk to me for a while. I said, I'm, I'm really struggling. I said, oh, th- um, why? And he said, oh, well, you know, I'm a bit scared of you. And I'm going, what? And it was just, it was really interesting. But I thought, okay, let's see it through his eyes. And and he goes, oh, well, most of my dealings with older white fellas has been great. And, uh, yeah, I'm just really struggling being around you. Now, 10 years ago, I would have gone, oh, what's he on, yeah. right? But I went, wow, that's the effect subconsciously that's going on with this guy. And and I, there wasn't a lot I could do uh, other than just empathising with him and mm. trying to say, you know, there was nothing to be scared of me about, but it was real for him. Mm. And... Uh, yeah, so I changed someone by behaviour and gave a bit more space and so forth. And but he was triggered, and I thought, I wonder what's gone on in his past for that to arise in him. You know, and that goes back to that earlier conversation around intergenerational trauma. And so, something may have happened, and you might not have even been the person, but something might have happened at the conference, which triggered a memory. Yep. And because you're the one closest to him. Yep. It was real. Mm. There was no question about that. It was real, and it had, and it was something he could not shake off. You know, and I was, I was, uh, yep, I was really surprised by that. Mm. Uh, well, and the thing is, I think you did the right thing. You, um, you had empathy, and you also didn't own it. Yeah, I didn't feel yeah. guilty. Yeah, I didn't feel guilty. But it took That's me a good. little. It took me a little bit. Uh, the, it took me a wee while for the empathy to come out, Jake, because I went into judgment straight away, mm. right? And going, oh, you know, 
come on, get a grip. Mm. But they went, hang Bloody on, ridiculous. Hang on. Yeah, and they went, hang on, hang on, I'm seeing it through my eyes, right? And, um, you know, the problem with them is I can't see it through his eyes. It's not possible for me to see it through mm. his eyes, but just to actually go, you know, there is something going on here far deeper than I can, yeah, yeah. Than, I, than I can understand and to give him some space and just, you know, talk to him and go, okay, you know, and I can't remember what I said. Look, he did respond, but it was, yeah, it was, it obviously triggered him, and it was, it was a, it was a big deal. Um, that is fascinating about Napui. Mm. I, I, that gives a whole different context because uh, from the outside, it looks like, oh, come on. Yeah. Get to the table, get this sorted out, you're holding the country up, yeah. you know, get this, this settlement, it's the biggest and, settlement. And this is the thing. Uh, Iwi aren't holding the country up, and Iwi have never held the country up. The government have designed us have designed a system which holds our country up. That's the problem. You know, it's taken twenty eight years for our, our our settlement. In the case of Ngaitahu, they lodged their claim in the eighteen hundreds. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, like about twenty years after the treaty. Right. Mm. So they lodged their claim that far ago. And the same with the Wanganui River. You know, the longest litigation case in the country, over 100 years. So 18, late 1870s, Wanganui River started. Okay, let's change gear, Chay. Let's talk about the future. Mm. Let's talk about. Cool. Let's talk about what you want to create going forward. Uh, before we do that, is there anything is there anything else you want to cover? No. No. Okay. So let's let's and then I want to oh, then I'm really interested in how you got here. <laughs> uh, Jeez. And and and, and uh, your journey. So let's. What's your give us your uh, your vision? What what do you want to create going forward? Uh, for me, as Che. Yeah, and I'm also interested in I'm I'm, I'm I've got more interest in this Mario party because I'm going. Oh, this isn't a race party. This is a mm. this is a philosophical and a values and so forth. So, you, what do you want to work on? What do you want to impact in New Zealand? Well, um, there, there's a there's a <laughs> me as a person. There's a there's a song by Diana Ross: "Reach out and touch somebody's hand, mm-hmm. make this world a better place if you can." And and some people will laugh and go, "Oh, well, that bloody la la stuff," but. What we need is love, and if we can foster a nation that are good people, that can work, that um, the structures are set up so that people are able to work, because when you work, you feel good. Uh, so that the structures are created to do that, so that as a society we have moved to a place where we care for each other, where we care for the land, and. You know, we're currently promoting a tiaki promise for all visitors that come here that they will help look after our land. Mm-hmm. We should also be doing a manaki promise to them where we guarantee that we will look after them when they are in our land. So how do we create a place where values of care uh, both ways, of ensuring that everybody has a chance to do well, to grow, but also that creates a, a place where we are all responsible for our actions rather than focusing just on our rights. That's the place that I want to live in and that's the place that I hope we can all grow together, that we can all have a hammer and some nails and some wood to build together because it's only going to work if we do it all together. And so that's bringing... All our diversity, you know, there are so many languages that live here. It's not not it's not putting aside our treaty obligations, but how do we encourage everybody that lives here and calls Aotearoa New Zealand home? How do we encourage us all to be able to contribute? Because when we can contribute, and when we create a reciprocal society, you give some, I give some we do well together, mm. then that'll be pretty hard to beat. Mm. And it'll also make us be a magnet rather than being a country that's so far away from everywhere. Mm. 
because the reason why some of these uh, micro spaces have been created around the world where places are just going off is because they're changing the value systems to grow themselves as communities. So do you have do you have a model do you have a model that you see working offshore something you see and go that's that's something I want to not copy but see that's inspiring. There's definitely some things. I don't have a model as such but I've got ideas that I think that could help us. Right. And so Scandinavia highly taxed but they've got a good system that helps their communities. There's all of this housing stuff that's happening in Austria that's pretty amazing. There's all of this work happening in Peru around food and um, respecting the mana of the potato because, you know, Peru is the origins of potato. Um, there's, there's work in Hawaii, um, especially to do with the land and sustainable fishing. Sustainable fishing in Iceland, where they're created, where every single part of the fish is used, whereas at the moment most of us around the world are still wasting half. Right, yep. Um, you know, so there's bits from everywhere. And I think if we could be part, if we could be courageous as a nation to to create a project where we come together as a nation to create what New Zealand could be like, that's when we'll get to a different place. And we've got to have a government who's courageous enough to do it past a political cycle. Mm. Okay, mm. okay, for the next 10 years, we're going to do this. Mm. And we're going to do it so that we can create something that's amazing. Mm. You know, what we've done at home as part of Ruapu Whānau Transformation as we did a, a, a com- we've been doing community work for the communities of Raitehi, Ohakune and Waiori, where we've looked around the world and around New Zealand what works to help us, rather than when is the government going to help us, yep. when is the council going to help us. No, let's bloody roll our sleeves up and let's help ourselves. Mm. So that's what I, that's my dream is to be able to create a space for us to think, to dialogue, and be courageous to start with a blank piece of paper. Because the moment that I start talking about models, I'm putting my bias in. Mm. But how do we bring bring things together? And we'll need some pretty smart people to be able to take us on that journey. And there's some pretty smart people doing some amazing things. Yeah. Um, and the more we involve all groups... It'll help us. I think one of the other things, you know, you talk about work, we forget, Jay, that we are designed to struggle and we are happier when we struggle. Uh, you know, I heard well, a, and that struggles in the noise, eh, in the it, head. All, all sorts of different yeah. places, right? It is, it is uh, there was a great um, podcast I listened to uh, around happiness and the science of happiness. If we got everything that we wanted in life, we'd be profoundly unhappy. Uh, and it's, it's uh, and, and when they talked about this, I went, huh? And it's absolutely true that, mm. you know, and you see, you see children who are given everything and whatever, that doesn't make them happy. You know, we are designed to struggle. Struggle is a good thing. It's not supposed to be easy. Well, and there's the saying in, in Māori, the marapu at the which is all about, uh, pursuing that which is hidden. There should always be a pursuit in life. Right? And so I'd rather use the word pursuit rather than struggle because there should always be a, a, a pursuit for something you can't see. Right. The maungaro. Right. Because that takes us to an untangible place so that it takes us to a hard place because it's easy when you can see stuff. But it, you you go to... Pursuing something that you can't see because that helps you. Because if you can only see the iceberg, oh, that's easy. We're going there. We'll go there. Yep. Mm. Yep. Chay, the the, uh, history starts in the next few years being taught in schools. 
that's going to be a fascinating event for New Zealand. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the curriculum is framed up, and uh, I see that as being a huge step forward for for the nation to actually embrace that yeah. for a change and have that installed in our kids. Um, any views on that? Uh, I'm really excited by it. Um, it actually started under the Māori Party, so it's actually already, most of it's ready to be taught now. And my only disappointment is that they didn't start it next year. Right. Because the history teachers have been, so history.co.nz, that's the history teachers, all of their work that they've been working on for some time now. And we could have started next year um, noting that there are always going to be teething problems. And I prefer it to start next year so that it starts under this administration. Because if the government changes, right, that next government might bloody change it. Right. And then they'll often use, oh, our coalition partner didn't like it. So, you know, there's these, there's these nuances which happen. But the idea is amazing. It's so good. You know, like seventh form history for me, there was a New Zealand curriculum brought in. Because I'm, I'm a history geek. I'm a boy fact. <laughs> and um, they started talking about teaching us about Te Tokawaru from Taranaki, the best strategist during, um, one of the best strategists in the world against the British Empire. Mm. And um, Mr. Parker was talking to us and teaching us all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I says, oh, that's blah, 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 sir. How do you know that? And I says, oh, I thought everybody knew it. <laughs> says, no, no, this is new history. It's only been researched. No, no? Uncle Matt talks about it all the time. Down the marae. That's what? And so I started talking about Tito Kawaru that I knew. Right. And he goes, yeah, that's right. That's what Jimmy Pellich has just written about, all of the stuff. And, and I, oh, see, I thought everybody knew that. Oh, I thought that's what we all talked at our homes. <laughs> so, you know, a young yeah. young seventh form student who had heard, heard all these stories of what I thought was all our history that we all knew. And um, that was in seventh form. It was the first time then. And I, I just can't wait. I can't wait for it. Because the sooner we can learn our collective history as a nation and the fact that in 1855 there were letters sent from our parliament to the House of Commons saying we need to pull out of this nation. We need to pull out of this country because the natives here have penetrated the economy of the whole South Pacific and we can't beat them. It's going to be better for us to leave. And they got the instruction, start a war. And so, yeah, five years later, they started the war, you know, and they just commemorated it on Monday and Labor Day at Taranaki. Yeah. And so... I didn't know that. Yeah. One of my uh, one of my heroes in New Zealand is Ian Taylor, and uh, you know his his uh, uh, his passion for telling the story of Coupe and so forth. And I'm thinking, you know, when the young Maori and Polynesians understand how unbelievable Coupe was as a navigator, mm. and um, uh, you know, all those stories, it's going to make a huge difference, right? Because yeah. all that history has been taken away from them. Well, and, and the thing is, is that everything in Māori dim, well, in, in, in the Pacific is coded. So there's the literal meaning, but then the codes have layers of understanding. And the codes can then also go into the geology of the land, all of the science that helps create different places. And Kupu, when he came here, he was following an octopus. But what it's actually talking about is that there was one big Pacific nation and its tentacles reached out throughout this whole water body. And and the stories of Kupu, uh, the stories of many of the navigators, of Toroa, of Turi, of Te Maungaroa, of Ruatea, all of these different navigators, um, the more that we can start to share and be comfortable with sharing because when we have shared in the past, we've been abused. Um, and so we've got to work 
we've got to work through some of that as well. And a classic example is this whole notion of kaitiakitanga. Mm-hmm. And so kaitiakitanga is an amazing concept of protecting the environment. But what some of the big commercial companies in the primary sector and other sectors have been able to do is glean a, a heap of value by pinning that to their story. And you know, story means more cash. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the way it's been done has now made Māori a bit shy about sharing in those spaces. And so we've got to work through some of that because they then try and protect those stories as their stories, as yep. the stories of those companies. Yep. And so, but I think we, we, we are going to have to share because we do have gifts that we can give not just to Aotearoa but to the world. But it needs to be authentic, yeah. uh, Che, right? Because it's it's you see when things get bastardised mm. and you forget what its actually true uh, meaning is. And I see companies using that yeah. and going, oh, yeah, it's, it's, that's interesting. And I'm seeing it in the farming sector now with this word regenerative farming, right? So it's something yep. that I've been learning. Up. And now I hear all these farmers going, oh, we, we're farming regeneratively. And I'm going, no, you're not. That's just that's not even close. Mm. You are doing maybe five percent of regenerative practice, and you're going. We're doing regenerative agriculture. Okay, yeah. no, you're not. Yeah, we're that's going back. It. Yeah, it's about going back to the old, back to the future. <laughs> yep. And so, and and so, I see that being really quickly bastardised within yep. twelve months. And going, that's what we're doing. And going, no, you're using a word, which is what you're talking yeah. about. Actually, yeah. not using just the word, but actually understanding the value. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, Che, thank you so much for your time. What um, we're looking at out because Che's got to hop on a on a plane at some stage. Che, what uh, before we wrap up? Tell me, is there anything else you want to cover in this in this uh, podcast? I think know? there's too much to cover, but this is take one. <laughs> we can take one. Take yeah, one. yeah, this is take one. But I think I think the key thing is we all want to do well, and as we do well. How do we help others up? Because mm. I think that's our responsibility to humanity is to pull, lift others up. If you're doing well, how do you, how do you grab that other person's hand and help them? Mm. And as you help them, allow them to be them. Mm. Mm. And I, I think that's, that's the key message from me because uh, at the end of the day, we're all humans and we focus in on the five percent that makes us different rather than the ninety five percent where we are the bloody same. Mm. And how do we have a heart to focus in on the majority of things which make us so similar the same and celebrate that other five percent that you know, physically makes us different. I think that's me. Perfect way to round up, mate. Cheers. Che, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and thank you personally for having such a big impact on me in the last few years. You know, it was, uh, uh, you were a very good teacher and uh, my life is better having met you. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's I'm less ignorant than I used to be. And it's, it's work in progress. Oh, it's working for all of us. <laughs> it's work in progress. So, yeah, Che, uh, thank you for your time. Loved interviewing. Part one now. We're <laughs> going to wrap that up. And part two uh, in the near future. Awesome, Half. Thanks a lot. You've just been listening to an episode of Stuff That Matters Now brought to you by Collective Intelligence. I hope you enjoyed listening to the fun stuff, the rugged stuff, and the complete stuff up so that have helped this particular Collective Intelligence Member Evolve, while making the world a better place. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. Contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.